the boss I was working with at one point said, oh, you should do that kind of experiment, that kind of experiment. And I said, well, look, he said, I'm more interested by doing something in, the f in cold fusion. Or he said, cold fusion, I mean, don't do that, he said. I said, why should I not do that? He said, because it doesn't work. I said, yes, it works. I've done experiments. I know people who have done experiments. I know Pons and Fleischmann. And look, he said, if you decide to do it, you cannot work with me anymore because I don't want my name to be attached to your name. With congressional funding dead, Fleischmann and Pons moved to France to carry on their research. By 1992, we had uh, video recordings of intense energy release. By the summer of 1994, we had demonstrated sustained energy release. If you say you want, you wish to make this into a device by about the year 2000, if the resources had been available, we would have got to the year, to the, the, that particular point, probably before the year 2000. But uh, this did not happen. Cold fusion pioneers carried on despite continued attacks on their reputations and careers. By 1999, eight international conferences had been held with several thousand technical papers published in peer-reviewed journals worldwide. In the U.S., the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI, a private consortium including dozens of utility companies, spent over $10 million to investigate coal fusion claims. In its final report, EPRI concluded, quote, definite evidence of nuclear reactions were detected. But with the federal funding out of the picture, proponents of coal fusion had to look elsewhere to continue their revolutionary science. In the mid-90s, the government of Japan funded a cold fusion program called New Hydrogen Energy. Though short-lived, it inspired many Japanese scientists to break new ground in this area. The governments of Italy and France funded research, and many private startups in the U.S. convinced of the commercial potential of the process began securing related patents while carefully avoiding the stigma of being tagged cold fusion. Over the last decade, independent inventors have developed cold fusion devices that have at first glance seemed promising, only to fall short when examined by qualified scientists. But what if a cold fusion device did exist that produced excess heat consistently before trained independent eyes? Clean Energy Technologies of Sarasota, Florida has already brought scientific demonstration cells to market. Using ordinary water, and tiny metal coated beads, they claim their Patterson power cell is produced up to 1,000 times the input power. Motorola sponsored a test of this cell wherein 20 watts of heat were produced for 11 hours. This heat continued even after the tiny input electricity was turned off. They start producing excess heat almost right away, you know. By the time we do the measurements, there's already excess heat. While carefully avoiding being called cold fusion, Dr. Randall Mills of Blacklight Power in New Jersey has attracted substantial funding, creating a company positioned to be a leading manufacturer in the new energy age. Some of our better experiments with the electrolytic cell have generated as much as a thousand percent excess heat. For example, if we put one watt into the cell, we will get 10 watts out. This vessel is sitting here making, as we watch, helium-4 and the temperature is 215 degrees centigrade. This is the key. You change this just a little bit, and it doesn't work at all. Now, this is a very novel concept that you can have a nuclear fusion occur at 215 centigrade and one atmosphere pressure. The uh, temperature records quite clearly indicates in these experiments, as it does in less cases experiments, that there is an unexplained source of heat and the uh, magnitude of that source of heat is approximately the right uh, value to account for the uh, observed helium. So inside this vessel now for six, seven weeks, we have had deuterium fusing to helium-4 and given this excess temperature of about 35 degrees centigrade, which is big, a really big effect. The technology of catalytic fusion developed by Dr. Les Case is one of the most extraordinary developments we have in the cold fusion field. He has excess heat, massive excess heat, and also helium-4 production. 
the very nuclear ash that the opponents of coal fusion uh, demanded in the early days. It appears as though he is very close to having a self-sustaining device that will keep hot by itself, generate steam, hot water, perhaps electricity, before much longer. Alchemy, the idea that lead can be turned into gold, was always considered a medieval myth. While modern science has proved the transmutation of elements is possible, the process is far too costly to be practical. Yet as early as 1992, scientists experimenting with cold fusion observed in their spent cells small amounts of metals like copper, silver, and zinc that simply shouldn't be there. Kevin Wolf, a nuclear physicist, incidentally, made many measurements of tritium. Then he got some even more astonishing results as early as 92, which were these transmutational results, the, the metal forming another metal inside it. The electrode, you see, which was super, super anti-paradigm. Um, you know, there's that dreadful word alchemy, which we mustn't use, but it, it was a form of that in a way, that it was creating new metals, you see. Tadayoshi Omori and Tadahiko Mizuno of the Hokkaido University in Japan produced volumes of data documenting the production of metals from iron to platinum. Along with these, consistently, came the production of excess heat energy. The potential environmental benefits of this technology are awesome. Companies like SETI, Trenergy, and the Cincinnati Group are developing ways to solve the world's radioactive waste problem, changing radioactive materials into some other form of harmless metal. In 1999, developments in this area prompted the DOE to award a research grant to Professor George Miley of the University of Illinois. However, within days of the grant announcement, the ever-vigilant critics of cold fusion science attacked Miley's work and killed his funding. On the secret panel set up to repeal the grant was the ardent enemy of cold fusion science himself, Dr. John Hizinga. Nuclear energy was once a laboratory curiosity. So let's assume that these devices can be developed. The future is then almost unlimited. It could be the end of the fossil fuel age, the end of oil and coal, and the end, incidentally, of many of our worries about global pollution and global warming. While the environmental challenges faced by the U.S. often make front page news, the pollution problems encountered by third world nations and countries relying exclusively on fossil fuels fare much worse. Two-thirds of the cities has problem in pollution. And one-third of the land of my country is damaged by the acid rain. The 80% of the power energy source is from coal. We have 1.2 billion population, and we anticipate it will be one half or more billion in the middle of next century. We consume one ton of the coal per capita. So if we increase our power assumption of power consumption by a factor of three, then we will burn about five billion tons of coal in the middle of next century. What is the ultimate potential of cold fusion technology?